Hey guys, welcome to another edition of the Heritage Wealth Planning YouTube channel. Another Josh Rance topic we're going to talk about today. And today we're going to talk about an article that was just in Reuters, I think two days ago, about the Fidelity Freedom Funds and some of the information that you should be aware of, not just pertaining to, to Fidelity Freedom Funds, but just target date funds in general. So let me minimize myself here, kind of get myself out of the way. Let me share with you this article. It's actually real interesting. And uh, you can see the headline, Special Report, Fidelity Puts Six Million Savers on Risky Retirement Path. And the author, Tim McLaughlin and Renee Dudley from Reuters. And so let's just go down here. For three years, the mutual funds uh, in Fidelity's flagship retirement franchise have outperformed at least 85% of their competitors, reversing a decade-long trend of subpar performance. Hmm. So a decade, 10 years goes by, and Fidelity had subpar performance in their flagship retirement funds, freedom funds was what they call them. And then all of a sudden, in the last three years, a trend changed where they're now they're beating their peers. Why? Well, let's take a look down. Since a strategy overhaul that took effect in 2014, Fidelity has substantially increased exposure to stocks including those from volatile emerging markets. The firm also scrapped a long-held belief of sticking to preset allocations of stocks, bonds, and target date funds, in their target date funds. Now, portfolio managers try to time the market, for instance, by moving billions of dollars out of money-losing commodity bets and into Chinese stocks and U.S. tech shares. And as you can see my little note here, that's market timing. Per, I mean, there's just no other way around that. That's market timing. We think... Uh, let's see, commodities aren't doing well, so we're going to get out of there and we're going to move into Chinese stocks and U.S. tech shares. And we're going to increase our exposure to stocks as well, and we're no longer going to have a fixed asset allocation. Look, I'm not saying good, I, I, they can do whatever they want. I'm, I just dropped my mic, sorry guys. I'm not saying it's good, bad, they can do whatever they want. I just find it interesting that the Fidelity Freedom Funds, and I'm going to talk about these target date funds here in a little bit, uh, at Fidelity, though, are very actively managed, not just in asset allocation, stocks, bonds, and cash, but also in the type of investment they have as well. Getting out of commodities, moving into Chinese stocks, getting out of commodities, getting into U.S. tech stocks and whatnot. And so that change corresponds in 2014 with 15, 16, 17, where they've outperformed. Their exposure to stocks, stocks have made their, mar their uh, portfolios look better, some because the stock market has done well over the last three years. And what we find here is it's not just fidelity. Today, many target date fund managers have turned to riskier investments to boost returns. <sighs> so what do we have? We have fidelity underperforming, they had a fixed allocation of stocks, bonds, and cash. Money's going out because they're underperforming. They got to increase their market share because I'll show you here in just a second how bad the market share decline was for Fidelity that the good folks at Reuters talk about. So what do they do instead? Well, they take more aggressive approach, which means they're either outperforming and then others fall behind to say, well, we got to keep up with the Joneses. We're going to have to increase our investments to more riskier investments in order to boost returns. But Fidelity, according to Ron Sirs, and I'm familiar with Ron's writing, has gone further than its peers. And Ron says, these funds with high concentrations in stocks are a time bomb. Time bomb. The, the sector is even riskier today than in 2008 financial crisis when some funds dropped by 40%. Ugh. It's riskier today than in 2008. Now, remember, 2008, Fidelity had a fixed approach of asset allocation, stocks, bonds, and cash. They don't have that fixed approach anymore, approach anymore. On top of that, they've got more stocks and they can market time so they can go to Chinese stocks relative to commodities and vice versa, whatever they want to do. And in 2008, the markets fell 40%, not just Fidelity, but for a lot of these funds out there. And that's kind of scary. Now, Again, 2008 was literally a once in a two, a twice in a century flood, so to speak. I mean, the Great Depression, 
we had a mar sell-off in 73 and 74, not even close to what October 2007 and March of 2009 was. 2001 and 2, the, the S&P was down 9, 11, and 22%, uh, respectively, in 2001 and 2000, 2001 and 2002. Yeah, so this is the second worst sell-off in 2007 to 2009 that we've seen essentially since the dawn of the modern era of investing, which is 1926. Is that likely to happen again? Eh, who knows? Probably not. But still, what Ron is saying is at the end of the day, the Fidelity Freedom Funds are more aggressive than they were even in 2008. And if all things go south, that could be a, that could be a very, very inopportune place, especially for a newly minted retiree. And here is the question going on to that. The Fidelity 2020 fund for investors two years away from retirement fell 6% from January 26th to February 8th. 6% it did in 10 days time. That's pretty substantial, especially if you're thinking you're in a, you know, two years from retirement. The sharp downturn reflects Fidelity's decision to keep 60% of its 2020 investors' money in stocks compared to an average of 40% for older savers in similar funds. And so here is the reason why Fidelity's Freedom Funds are outperforming as of 2014, because they have a 50% more exposure to stocks. 50% more than their peers for a like-minded 2020 fund. Now, I don't have any qualm with that. I mean, for heaven's sake, if you're going to retire in 2020 and you're 60 years old, that means you need your money to last another 30 to 35 years. I got no problem with that whatsoever. The problem is, does that investor in the 2020 fund realize he has that much in stocks? I don't know. My, my presumption is probably not. And if you have that much in stocks and you're down 6% in 10 days time and you're about to retire in 2020, is that something you sign on for? I, I don't think so. But again, I, you know, hey, teach his own if you know what you're getting then you should take the risk to get the return that's the whole thing with risk return fidelity is outperforming because they're taking on more risk more risk means more potential for downside like we saw in the in the from january 25th to february 10th let's keep going because i think this is incredibly interesting actually with its 2014 changes fidelity needed to address a long-standing problem with underperformance there you go so they're underperforming. They had to do something. Money was going out the door. People were taking their money. They said, we got we, we to close the gates. Can't have that money going out. And so they made it more aggressive. And so far, it's paid off. You know, the question, as Ron Serge says, is what happens when the markets take a turn for the worse? Had the <laughs> previous to 2015, when, the, when, the, uh, when they had this fixed allocation, before they went to more aggressive stocks and a little bit more market timing, this is pretty funny. Had the funds been a sports team, their record against the benchmarks would have been six wins, 40 losses at one time. <laughs> Woo! Let's see, a bad football team goes 2-14. and 14. The, you know, Take away the Cleveland Browns and the what 2007 Detroit Lions. They were 0-16. The worst teams hit uh, typically in an NFL season are 2-14, and 14, which essentially would have been what Fidelity was for one, two, three years running. Yeah, not good. All right, so let's keep going down here. So Fidelity did really poorly relative to its peers. That's why they made the change. You can't blame it for that. Um, but I want to keep sharing you something else here. All oh, right here. Fidelity said its new market timing strategy, which it calls active asset allocation, can capitalize on finding underpriced assets over the one to five year time horizon. And since 2014, the Freedom Fund PMs, the portfolio managers, have had discretion to adjust allocations and major asset classes by up to 10% in either direction. That's a pretty significant discretion. But here's what it comes down to. Fidelity has historically frowned on market timing. And in 2009, they get a presentation to the Vermont State and Municipal Retirement uh, system saying that they felt there's a low probability of repeated success in market timing. But now they're market timing. Things change. I get that. 
Thoughts change. I'm not the same person I was necessarily in 2009. You know, people can change. I 100% get that. I just, I chuck a little bit because they're saying to the Vermont State and Municipal Retirement System that they weren't going to market time because they felt it had a low probability of repeated success. Apparently that has changed now. And I got to tell you, to their credit, over the last three years, their retirement freedom funds have outperformed. So in the short term, it's worked. I want to show you something. Look at this, though. This is the chart of the 2020 fund at 1730 a share, down to 1630 a share. So that's your 6% decline in basically a week's trading time. Oof. That's a pretty significant uh, hurdle to jump over if you're someone about to retire. I think I got a couple of, yeah. Until the changes in 2014, Fidelity held higher concentrations of more conservative investments, such as bonds, aimed at protecting investors against the downside. Even with a more conservative mix than Freedom Funds have today, Fidelity struggled to control the downside losing 41% for those younger savers and 25% for those near retirement. So at the end of the day, Fidelity essentially threw in the towel. They said, we were down 25% in our more conservative approach in 2008, and we're underperforming in the upside from then on. We might as well just say, well, if we're going to be down 30% in the negative years, but we can outperform in the positive years, we're going to take that. That's what it seems like it looks like to me. Look, I mean, they lost 25% in their near retirement people, for the folks who are near retirement, essentially their version of today of the 2020 fund in 2008, <laughs> on a more conservative portfolio. And hence, and even after that, when the markets pick back up, they're, dra they're lagging their peers. You can't blame them, frankly. You can't blame them for going a little bit more aggressive in the stocks. But again, protecting the downside, it's not happening there. Let's see if I have anything else to talk about in this thing, because I do find this interesting. All right, so I don't think I have anything else, but I do want to talk a couple. Yeah, right here, last one. Yeah, actually, I'm glad I came down here a little bit, because this is actually the, the fundamental thing I find. This guy, Morningstar analyst Jeff Holt says, in the long run, the biggest risk to target day funds is they won't meet investor expectations for avoiding losses. And the funds, he said, are so popular and because investors believe they're designed not to lose money. A lot of investors, I believe, feel that they have this target date fund, 2020, I'm going to retire in two years, it's 2018, the and the retirement fund or the freedom fund or the life cycle fund or the life strategy fund, all these various companies have different uh, names. It's all semantics though. But if I'm getting ready to retire in two years and my fund is a 2020, I believe it should be keep me from a catastrophe like we had in 2008. Unfortunately, that is not necessarily the case as we can tell just from what happened in 2008, but on top of that, how much more aggressive these target date funds have become. And so if you're going into a target day fund and you think it's there to protect you against downside loss, I highly suggest you rethink that. Look at what happened in 2008. Look at what happened in the 10 day time frame in 2018. Shoot, look at the beginning 45, 30, 45 days of 2016. Look at the time frame from January, the mid July 2011 to mid August of 2011. You can see. Boom. It was like this going up. Boom. And that's what happened. Even these target income funds, which are for people who are retired now and don't want the volatility, took it on the chin pretty good. And that's my concern with these target funds. I actually like them. A lot of people on YouTube will say, ah, I don't agree with that. I think it has a place for the people who understand them. Remember, the mutual fund company's perspective is that you are going to need this money not just because in 2020, but all the way up to 2040 and 45, if not 2050. You've got to maintain some exposure to stocks. You're not going to escape the need for stocks because of inflation and taxes. You've got to overcome inflation and taxes, the two biggest risks to your portfolio in the long term. And the only way to do that is to have exposure to equities. 
Does that mean you'll be safe on the downside? No, not at all. It just means for someone who has 25 years ahead of them in retirement who are drawing income off these portfolios, they need to have these exposures to other asset classes other than just safe bonds and government bonds and maybe even CDs. And that's a dilemma. Some people over here in these 2020 funds might think they're buying a fund that's a lot more conservative than it truly is. Some people over here are going to say this fund isn't performing very well relative to this peers. I need it to be more aggressive. So you have a kind of competing thought process here of who is going to come. Are you going to be more aggressive to make the people who want to get more attraction and get more yield, more returns happy, or are you going to be less aggressive to minimize the downside risk when that market decline comes? That's a tough one. And all life strategy, target funds, life cycle funds, retirement date funds, they all have the same dilemma to, con to contend with, not just fidelity. But the reason I wanted to point this one out is just because I saw this article yesterday. And it seemed pretty interesting to me, the massive switch that fidelity has taken on, at least in these funds from essentially passive management, at least passive allocation, as passive asset allocation, 60% stocks, 30% bonds, 10% cash or whatever, to definitely more active asset allocation and market timing as well. So look, do your research on these things. Look at those dates I mentioned before, July, the midsummer 2011, the beginning of 2016, uh, January 25th to the beginning of February 2018. What did your fund do? Did it get hammered? Did it maintain itself? If it maintain itself, are you sacrificing upside returns because you have too much bonds? Are you okay with that? Because you can't have both. You can't have stock-like return with bond-like risk. You can't. It's impossible. Impossible to have that. So just keep that in mind as you're analyzing this stuff. So my question to you, my friends, do you have target funds? Maybe you have the thrift savings plan, life cycle funds. Maybe you have one for the Vanguard, their life strategy funds. I don't know. What do you have? You like it? Did you have one and got out of it? Did you see a problem with it? Just what are your thoughts, feelings? Put it in below. Let other people know what your thoughts are because other people have the same questions that you do. Don't forget to subscribe. As I always say, that red button right there. Hit that subscribe button. That just lets you know. That just signs you up with content. But you got to hit the bell for notifications. The notification bell will tell you when we're publishing stuff via email. And then again, anytime you log into YouTube, the bell will be red that says, hey, you got new, you got new content. Always, I appreciate your time on the Heritage Wealth Plan Planning YouTube channel. Any comments below, just put them down there. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thanks, guys.